Today on The Grave Talks, the spirits of the White Hill Mansion, a conversation with Don Reichard. The White Hill Mansion is an iconic landmark in the historic town of Fieldsboro, New Jersey. Robert Field laid the foundation for a small home in 1722, and from the humble beginnings of its first structure to its expansion, White Hill Mansion stands as a testament to the resilience of time. Its true character was revealed during the tumultuous years of the American Revolution. Mary Peel Field, the widow of Robert Field, opened her doors to both Hessian and colonial troops, safeguarding the mansion from the ravages of war and earning its place in history. The stately mansion has seen many people come through its doors, from gangsters to servicemen, even prostitutes, and many still linger behind its walls. Strange occurrences became commonplace, weaving a web of whispers and tales that branded White Hill Mansion as one of the most haunted places in New Jersey. From shadowy figures to chilling encounters, visitors have reported a myriad of paranormal experiences further enhancing the mansion's mysterious appeal. Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation with event coordinator Don Reichard about the mysteries of White Hill Mansion, where history and hauntings intertwine and the echoes of the past refuse to be silenced. I want to talk a little about you first, because you were with the Friends of White Hill Mansion. Yes. And you were also a paranormal investigator, which is pretty interesting considering the White Hill Mansion and its history. How did you get involved with the White Hill Mansion? So I used to have my own paranormal group. And one of the girls on my team um, found the house on a historic registrar. So she called and asked if we could come and visit, and the mayor said yes. So he just opened up the house and said, have fun, and he left. (laughs) So I didn't know anything about the history of the house, and um, I fell in love with the architecture, and the inside of the house is amazing looking, very, um, let's see, peeling paint and falling plaster and all this kind of really cool stuff. Um, we weren't in the house maybe five minutes before my husband and I heard voices and we had a lot of really interesting thing happen while we were in there. So I was, I was hooked. I just fell in love with the house. And once I found out the history, I just asked if I could become a volunteer and I've been there ever since. And how did you become interested in the paranormal? Was that something that goes way back to maybe when you were a child or did you de- Developed interest later in life. How did that even come about? Yeah, I was. It wasn't until I was an adult. We bought, we bought a house in 1997, and when we moved into the house, strange things started happening in the house. But it was quite a few years before I mentioned it to my husband that I thought there were some odd things that happened um, during the day when I was alone. Yeah. And then he mentioned some strange things happen to him every now and then. And then that was it. So we started trying to figure out if my house was haunted and then just developed this curiosity about the paranormal. So we started um, our own ghost hunting group and started ghost hunting from there. Looking back on it, you know, because I get why you didn't say anything at first, because especially if you've never had a paranormal experience and now you're having some things happen, the first thing is you think, I'm going crazy, and or will someone else think I'm crazy if I tell them? So I could understand why you kept it to yourself for a while. Looking back on it, do you believe the house was haunted? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it actually took me probably close to eight years before I said anything about it. But looking back on all the crazy stuff that had happened through the years, I think what finally convinced me was when my son was about five years old. And he said there was a man standing at the bottom of the stairs. And I just knew that he saw a ghost. 
Oh, you know, yeah. I didn't really think it was an intruder. I just assumed it was a ghost. I didn't even bother looking. You um, know your house is haunted when? when yeah, you don't is- even bother to get out of bed. You're like, okay, honey, it's fine. It's an apparition. Go back to bed. Yeah, it's all good. So it's funny. He's 20 and one now, but he still remembers the apparition at the bottom of the stairs. And with your husband also having experiences and not saying anything, were you both kind of relieved to find out that it was happening? I, because it's a little unnerving to live in a house with activity, but to find out that it was happening to both of you and there really was something there that yeah, had to be reassuring. I think that just kind of made us like just more curious. I mean, the thing is, is we didn't feel any danger or being threatened or anything like that. So it wasn't like some of these cases where you feel like you have to run away. It just felt like some weird things happened every now and then, which just made you curious and not fearful, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then we just started talking. We just, the more we talked about the more things that we realized that things have happened in the past could have been paranormal. And then once you started your team, Did you investigate a number of different places before you went to White Hill Mansion? We did. And we we got very lucky at the time. I met a great bunch of people and we started investigating private homes, kind of people that were in the same situation that I was in that had experiences and just didn't know whether or not it was paranormal activity or not. So we did quite a few places before we got the opportunity to go to White Hill. Um, It was one of the first places I went to that was, um, it wasn't quite on the um, state register of historic places at the time, um, but it was definitely a historic house, but it was one of the first historic places that we visited. When you think about the history of your area of the country, you think back to the Revolutionary War, there's Native Americans, there's all this history that happens there. It's really, a, there's a lot of paranormal activity. Yeah. And one of the things you have to remember on the East Coast is that, I mean, the history just started here at the very beginning of the country. I mm-hmm. mean, of course, you have Native American stuff, and you also have a lot of people that settled around the Delaware River. I mean, we're just not even that far from Washington's Crossing, which is a park, which is, of course, where Washington crossed the Delaware in December of 76. So between Revolutionary War stuff and Native American stuff, and then, of course, you just keep going from there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, the rumor is that there's more paranormal activity around waterways. Mm-hmm. You know, but my mm-hmm. theory is, is that you had more people living around waterways. So if there is going to be a haunting, there's probably more hauntings near a river than somewhere else. It just makes sense to me. And especially in the time frame, you know, like when this house was built, that's major transportation. You know, it was easier to put things on barges and send them down the river than have... Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there was, I mean, the house sits on a bluff right on the Delaware River, and there was a wharf there. So, you know, Robert Field at the time, he had his own barges or vessels or whatever he had down there. He had a couple different kinds of waterways that he would use to transport your goods. And of course, that was the fastest way to get your groceries. They didn't really have grocery stores back then. So, of course, your goods would have come up the Delaware River, probably from Philadelphia, or some of the other farmlands, and then you would have had your servants or your slaves take it off the boats and bring it up to the house. And this house predates the Revolutionary War by a number of years. And I I always question if I get the dates right, because, you know, when you're researching on the internet, I don't always trust everything 100%. But I had read that the the, the first home that was built on that site by Robert Field That was around 1722? Yes, that is correct. The land was used before him. The first building that we know of on the site was 1667. Oh, wow. So Robert Field inherited the land from his uncle and had a house built in the 1720s. We're not quite sure if that's part of the mansion now, if it was incorporated in there. We were tending to think that maybe it was on another site on their property because they owned over 600 acres of land. Oh, that's massive. That's a lot of land. 
It sure is. Um, we did three archaeological digs, and the last one was in December of 2023. And they think they might have found the original foundation. So it'll be a little while before we know for sure, um, because we have to do ground penetrating radar and we have to get grants and studies and all that stuff. But we're hoping that we think we might have found the foundation. That is exciting. That's very exciting. And with these archaeological digs, you have found quite a few artifacts, like a lot. About 20,000. What kind of things have you found in those, besides perhaps the foundation of the original home, which is huge? What well, other things the, have you the found? Land, the land was used by the Lenape. So we have quite a few prehistoric artifacts from the Lenape tribe, which would include things like oyster shells. We found pieces of pipe, buttons, things like that. And then we have Revolutionary War stuff like in that era. Dishes, cups, wine bottles, medicine bottles, things like that. During the um, Victorian age, there was a um, a potterer that lived there that had a kiln in the basement. So a lot of pottery. And it's really interesting because back then you didn't have um, sanitation services. So you would have thrown all your trash in your privy. True. So they found on, the, on one of the digs... Um, I guess you would call it an outhouse. And that's where they found a good amount of artifacts, which you would have just dumped in your privy. And then when it filled up, you just dug a new one. That's true. I don't think about that's where you would dump stuff, but it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And that was kind of news to me too. Just something never really thought about. And the house has seen so much when you think about how the world has changed, you know, even since the first house was built on that site up to when one of the fields he built onto the house at some point and made it what it looks like today, which is quite big. It, is it three stories? The original house wasn't as big. So there was the 1750s and then the 1780 edition then it was changed again in the 1890s, and then it was changed again in the 1920s. So it's almost like the Franken house. When you go through there, there's a whole bunch of different eras. There's a lot going on in there. But it's really fun when you look at it to try to see what time period is what. So one of the things that we talk about on our tours is what the original Georgian house would have looked like and how you can still see parts of it on the outside of the house, on the exterior. And then you can see how the Victorians, when they came in and changed it, um, how they developed it into a whole different kind of structure of the house. Um, and when you're on the inside trying to imagine what it would have looked like in the Georgian times, and especially on the second floor, that layout has changed multiple times up there and trying to imagine what it looked like in the different decades since it was built. Because it was not always a family home. So there was a time where a restaurant went in. There was, you know, during Prohibition, there was a speakeasy in the basement. And the speakeasy is still there. That speakeasy is 101 years old this year. Isn't that something? So yeah. this one house has seen just this huge amount of history in this time it's been built. And if you look at it from the outside, like if you were to just drive by it, and I don't know how close the road gets, if you can drive by it or if you have to drive up a driveway, it really does look like a house that you would go, okay, that one's haunted. It really has that appearance from the outside anyway. It and definitely has the creep factor. You can only see it by going down the driveway. And the driveway is covered in trees. And if you come through on a really foggy evening, boy, does it look creepy. I've been outside when the fog rolled in, and I was like, yeah, this is really scary looking. <laughs> it's quite amazing to me that it was never torn down, that it's still standing. Yes, very lucky. And I think, honestly, the restaurant saved it. Because who knows what would have happened to it had it not turned into a restaurant in the 1920s. There was another house on the property that survived until the 1970s. 
When the last owner died in the 1960s, it became abandoned and then kids broke into it. And then it became so damaged, there was no other choice, but I think it was a controlled burning. So they burned it to the ground. Um, and it makes me so sad that there wasn't a friend's group to save that house because that house was built in the 1720s. And that was also part of Robert Field's property at the time. Now, when the Friends of Friends of White Hill Mansion came in, what kind of state was the home in at that time? Pretty close to how it is now. The thing is, with preservation, it takes a really, really long mm-hmm. time because it of does. all the red tape and the amount of grants you get and the amount of work that can be done and the permissions that you have to get. So, you know, one of the first things that we had to do was develop a preservation plan so that you have to tell the state, this is our plans for the house and it has to be approved. Then you have to have a strategic plan. And then after that, then you need to save the foundation. So then you need a roof and you need gutters and you need to make sure there's moisture away from the foundation. So once the foundation is good, now you can start working on the exterior. So, you know, we have a fence around the house because a lot of that paint on the exterior is lead paint based, most likely. Oh, So by law, you have to keep a fence around it because we don't want children walking by and, you know, eating the paint chips, you know. So then there's that cleanup. That'll take a little while. So, you know, hopefully at some point we get to the inside of the house. And of course, we're going to need plumbing and we're going to need electric. And what's interesting about White Hill, which is is so different than some of the other places I had volunteered before this, is that you have so many different eras in that house is that we have to figure out how we're going to interpret each section of the house. So, of course, one section is going to be colonial, where we talk about the Revolutionary War and the things that the Fields family went through. And then another room is going to be Victorian, where we talk about some of the other families that live there. And then, of course, We're not going to tear out the speakeasy just to talk about colonial times. So, of course, we're going to keep the speakeasy in there so that we can educate people about prohibition and, and, you know, women's right to vote and that time era, too. So, yeah, it gets very complicated. So even during the restoration project, we also have to think about the next 20 steps going ahead. And there are restrictions on what you can do with historical properties and how you go about repairing them. Oh, absolutely. I mean, consider the state, if they give you a couple thousand dollars, they wouldn't be too happy if we put a hot tub in the back room. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, of course, when we do get a grant, they're going to come out for visits to make sure that we're doing things the correct way, that we're taking care of the house the correct way. Um, If we see a problem, we have to contact the preservation office, the historic trust, the cultural trust. Um, So there's a lot of different entities that are involved in projects like this. You know, a lot of people will say, well, your friends group, you guys have so much freedom to do so much. And that's not really true. Mm. So um, we have a lot of different entities within the state that we have to answer to. If you're lucky enough to come in contact with an entity, it's almost like going back in a time machine. Mm -hmm. So... You know, we have, some people come in and they just walk through a flashlight seeing if they can, I don't know, catch something. Um, but I find it more interesting just to sit in a corner with maybe some equipment or a camera or a reporter and just start talking and see if you can entice something to come and talk to you. Start talking about, you know, uh, the care of of animal husbandry, like your horses and your pigs, or talk about corsets or something in that time era that you think might interested, you know, make them interested to come and talk to you. So how does one person who has their cell phone and Google and all these things that we have in our, you know, in our lives right now, computers and cars, how do you make yourself interesting to a person or someone who was a person um, that led a completely different life than we did and try to imagine yourself in that world. And I find that so much fun and so fascinating. Because there would, especially the history of this house, historically, you might be talking to someone from the Prohibition era. You might be talking to someone from the 1750s. The Revolutionary War hasn't even happened yet. You know, this is still a colony. So to me, that's really an interesting kind of umbrella of the paranormal that could be going on in there. Yeah. And it always makes me wonder, like, whatever their level of intelligence or awareness is, you know, do they think we're crazy? (laughs) Like, maybe they just think we're nuts. 
She's our, pretty... our, our style of life is so different from theirs. And they wouldn't even recognize things. You know, you put out meters and lights and recordings and, you know, trying to talk to them. Like, they wouldn't even recognize any of these things. No. And it's also cool if you if you look at the uh, underneath everything, the humanity is still the same. You know, the way that we live our lives is completely different, but we're still people. We're still the same people. So there's got to be a bridge there somewhere where we can communicate. You know, they still had husbands, wives, children. They had problems. They had troubles. They had disasters. They had loves. And there's got to be a relationship there that we can meet in the middle and talk about it. And I find that really interesting to try to find that bridge. You know, I had gone in there when the pandemic started and just sat on the steps and just talked about, you know, the 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 Spanish flu when, when the pandemic and I was like, would anybody here have, did you live through the Spanish flu through that pandemic? How did you react to it? How did you feel? Did you lose anybody? And I didn't get any answers, but I did have a ball that was kicked down the stairs, which I thought, okay, they're trying to tell me something like, yeah, me. Yeah. So I think that there, there is a way to communicate and find a bridge there somewhere. Do you have any idea you know, because your experience there, along with every other group that's investigated there, do you kind of have any idea of who might be haunting the mansion? Is there some similarities that people have shared between their experiences? Yeah, totally. I have some guesses um, in each room. Now, first of all, there's 20 some rooms in the house. Um, I think that I've had experiences in just about everyone. And some of them are connected. I know there's two rooms on the second floor. Haunting wise, they're kind of connected. You can ask a question in one room and hear an answer in the other mm. or have the same experiences in that room. You could go into a next room and there's something completely different in that room. But I do think there is a consistent haunting in the bathroom on the second floor. So a lot of people who have come in have had the same kind of experience with something weird going on in that tub. So historically, we don't have any account of any deaths or murders or anything nefarious in that area. But I can tell you that it's very consistently haunted where um, people will pick up different kind of voices, um, like a female help or a male shadow or some kind of activity in that room. In that room, I have no idea who could be in that room. But then there's a room right next to it, which seems a little bit older in time, where you can hear somebody with a rustle of a dress walk by. So I assume it's a female because you can hear like the rustle of like a heavy taffeta. And she doesn't answer your questions, but you can just hear her walk on by. You might be in one room and you'll hear a door open and there's nobody there, but then you'll hear the rustle of the dress. So who she is, we're not really quite sure either. But then when you go up into an attic, I've come across a spirit named Jack. Now, Jack seems to come from about the 1930s or the 1940s. So he's kind of got... um Hmm, let's say kind of like a mobster kind of vocabulary. If oh, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I have picked him up on recording saying this place is bugged, which I had to go back and look up. That, that word came into our vocabulary about the 1940s when recording devices, I guess, first started. So that's why I assume that it's around that time frame. He's the only spirit that I've seen and not heard. And he kind of looks like um, like a guy in a zoot suit from Tom and Jerry. Do you remember the zoot yeah, suit? Yeah, yeah, totally. TV show. And um, yeah, he's kind of like, he's not very nice, but he's also a jokester. I think he's the one that'll go around and like pull your hair or poke you in the back. I've been given a tour and been tapped on the shoulder, turned around to answer somebody, but then they're like 10 feet behind me. My guess it's him. We also think that Mary Field's second husband, who died in the house in 1788, we do seem to come across him time, like every so often, where he'll um, he'll actually answer you on a recording. 
he said his name was Tom. So in life, his name was Thomas Reed, Commodore Thomas Reed. And um, did you own the house? And he would say, I lived here. And then why do you stay here? Because I like it. Now, when Mary Field had married, she remarried in 1779 after she was widowed in 75. And that was remarried. Wasn't that yeah, mysterious sorry. circumstances when with her first husband, Robert? Yeah. So I, I'm i not sure. Like I, As soon as I think, no, it was just an accident and we're making too much of nothing. And then the next time I think about it and I go, yeah, maybe it was a little strange. So her first husband was, he, well, he was a justice of the peace. He was also a businessman. He was highly regarded in the area. He was a Quaker. Quakers weren't supposed to have slaves. They weren't supposed to be involved in conflict. And he was part of what was called a correspondence committee, which basically would write to the other colonies. Now, this is before the breakout of the Revolutionary War, but things were kind of heating up in 1775. So there was a lot of tension between the British and the colonists. And so um, he would have correspondence with other people in different areas about this tension. And he went to a meeting. And when he got to this meeting, he took one of his his boats. He took a sloop. And somehow, when he was coming home, he disappeared. Apparently, there was only one witness to this who said that he fell off the boat. And that this person tried to save him with an oar, but he went under. So maybe he did fall off the boat and drowned when his body was discovered a few days later. It had a giant gash on the head. So not Mm. having CSI back in 1775, they didn't know, did the gash come before or after he drowned? Right. Because of the political climate at the time, it was kind of dubbed as an accident. And I don't think they looked too closely in it. They just thought it was rather strange. And that unfortunately left his wife pregnant with their seventh child, 600 acres of land, many businesses to manage. And then the Revolutionary War kind of broke out in her backyard. So she was a tough cookie to come through all that. imagine going through all that? Yeah, I know, right? Um, And it's not like they had therapists back then. You know, she was (laughs) out there on her own trying to figure it all out. Yeah, I mean, she was confronted with the Hessians, the British, the American Navy. Um, Apparently, from some of her writings, she was very diplomatic. So whoever was occupying her house at the time, she was on their side. She was their best friend. I mean, consider you're just, you don't know who's going to win this conflict. You're just trying to survive with your family. So, of course, you're just going to play along and see what, what is the best advantage to you and your family. And I could see Mary staying there, like still being in the home, because she would be so connected to it. You know, she fought so hard to have that home. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never come across her ghost, but I've had psychics say that she's still there watching, which is interesting because she didn't die at White House. She actually died in, in Princeton, New Jersey in 1816. So all these years trying to save her family in that house. And then when her son inherited it, she went to go live with her daughter in Princeton eventually. So she wound up not dying there. But I do think that she is a presence at White Hill. She has to be. It would make sense to me. Because yeah. that's she fought so hard to keep to that me, house. Yeah, to me, she is like, you know how they always ask if, if you could go back in history and talk to one person, she would be my one person. Because the strength that she had to have, I mean, she had seven kids, only three lived to adulthood. (laughs) By the time her husband drowned in 75, she had already lost three babies. So that's tough. That's a tough thing to live with. I don't care what era you're from. Can't imagine living like that in that time. But, you know, at that point, the house, too, was smaller than what we see today, right? Correct. And I could see why she would still be there. We have, um, right now we have a grant out to do more research on her life. So I'm hoping by next year, we're going to have even more information on her. One of the guesses that we had is that her daughter, Grace, died when she was two. And then she had a newborn named Susan, and they both died around the same time. So 
we tend to think that it was probably an illness that took them right around, Mm -hmm. you know, the same time frame. How awful is that? That there's another reason why I would think she would still be there. She lost children there. And yeah, very true. And one of them we think is still there. So one of the claims is that Samuel, who we think died between maybe three and five in that time frame, has been seen and heard in the hallways. So, of course, we don't know for a fact which child or what era he's from. It's just kind of a guess that it's Samuel. But one of our volunteers has seen him in the flesh where they actually made eye contact before this little boy just kind of disappeared right in front of his eyes. And I remember having a conversation saying, well, I've never seen a kid here. So I started yelling down the hallway, hey, if there's a little kid here, come out and talk to me, please. And then all of a sudden heard a giggle and then running down the hallway. And my mouth just dropped to the floor. And I was like, well, I stand corrected. I have heard him now. Wow. So it's just a guess that it's Samuel, but some people feel pretty strongly that he is. And it's hard to tell with the style of dress that our volunteer saw him in to tell what year it was. Cause it was kind of like pants and suspenders and a white shirt and it was like an instant and then he was gone. So, it, you know, the clothing style didn't really give us any clues to who it could have been. So it's just a guess, but there's definitely a little boy on that second floor. I was reading about a, a woman who wrote a blog post. She had gone in there and she said she was with her family and the kids were with her. She had pretty young kids at that time. And you know how as a parent or if you're out with children and the child comes up behind you and they just grab your hand Mm -hmm. and you're like, yeah, you know, this is a very common thing. And so she turned around to acknowledge her child and there was nobody there and realized her kids were about 10 or 15 feet away. So it was not her kids. There was no reason she should have felt anybody grabbing her hand but it was such a recognizable feeling of a child to her. Yeah, I have seen claims of of people saying that something tugged on their pants or something tugged on the bottom of their shirt. And to me, I just always assumed that it was a child doing that because it's right about that size. And it's just funny how some people just kind of give off that aura of being like a comforting presence to a child. Mm-hmm that a ghost child or a spirit child would come up and feel comfortable enough to touch that person or try to get their attention. And especially because she was there with other kids and she's obviously a mom and she's putting out that mom energy and the little spirit was attracted to her. Yeah, that's really neat. I mean, I think it's a shame that this poor child, like I hope this child isn't scared or lonely. I am always the same way. I just... I want them to find peace and not be alone. Is it scary for them? I worry about things like that. Yeah, of course. I mean, every time someone has come in contact with him, he's laughing. And I say he only because of this one person saw it. It was a little boy. Do you know what I mean? It's hard Mm -hmm. to tell. We hear giggling if it's a boy or a girl. But it seems like there's always laughing, playing, happiness, which is kind of neat. So I'm hoping... Whoever he is, he's having a good time. So I've been told he likes to play hide and go seek. I um, I know that in one area, especially near the stairway, your equipment goes crazy. If he comes out, if he wants to come out and play, asking if he wants to play hide and seek, you usually get a reaction. Sometimes you can sing and you'll get a reaction to that. So he seems to like nursery rhymes and songs and things like that seem to make him happy. So I'm hoping he's okay. I know, me too. Makes me sad that he could be all alone. Yeah, I hope not. I hope he's got a buddy hanging out with him somewhere. And that wraps up part one of our conversation about the White Hill Mansion with Don Reichard. For more information, visit their website at whitehillmansion.org. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advance episodes, everything commercial free, then you can become a gravekeeper. Sign up on Apple Podcasts where you can try it for three days free, or you can also sign up at patreon.com slash the grave talks. 
I'm Carol Hughes, and for all of us here at The Grave Talks, thank you for listening.